I have this text which looks really thick. Actually, it is thick, but the writing is big because I was telling somebody I've reached that age when um, the distance between here and here matters ever so much more than it did before. Um, you know, right after Pat uh, and I uh, made our arrangement uh, for housing my, my papers here at Colby, uh, I found myself in my attic stacking the boxes and boxes of stuff that I'd accumulated over the years. Uh, you know, photographs, manuscripts, letters, and on and on. Much of it mysterious even to me at that point. Uh, and it occurred to me uh, that somewhere in these boxes of mine uh, was the story of my life as a poet, if I could find a way to tell it. Uh, and that's when um, I got the idea of making slides directly from the collection, thinking that if I could tell the story in this way uh, to you, I could uh, also maybe tell it to myself at the same time. So uh, this is that story. Um, in a text keyed to slides. It begins, if PowerPoint doesn't fail me, I've got this tricky little gizmo that's supposed to make slides advance. Let's see what happens. There we go. It, it begins in the 1940s with photographs from this album that was put together over the course of my childhood and youth by my mother. She made three of these albums, by the way. This one for me and the other two, same cover in different colors for my two brothers. The cover, as you see, features Uncle Sam at the helm of the ship of state during World War II, with cannons there at the lower right, a warplane at the upper left, and at the upper right an outraged eagle. Well, imagine for a minute that this ship of state represents not only a troubled nation, but a troubled family, and that Uncle Sam is a woman, my mother, who, as it happened, had her own difficulties at the helm of my family in the 1940s. Here she is with my two brothers and me in our yard where we're having a picnic. In the background is our apartment building in a project called Southview, located in Springfield, Vermont. It must be my father took the picture, but it seems appropriate looking back that he wasn't in it because he was often absent from the family in that period, organizing labor unions in New England shops and mills. Eventually, he left my mother for another woman he met on the road. There was no child support and no way for her to make money except through seamstress work. So my father's long absences and his final disappearance were a disaster for our family. And when he was gone, my mother was often angry at us and used her switch. But looking at snapshots like this one of my two brothers and me, you'd never know there was any disharmony because again and again the photographs she took present us dressed alike in clothes she sewed for us as characters in the unfolding narrative of a happy family. I'm the kid in the middle, by the way, the second born with more of Southview in the background, as you see together with period cars. In this somewhat fuzzy snapshot, we're wearing the Sunday suits my mother sewed, and she's arranged us in her typical one, two, three order up the stone steps of our backyard. It's not the greatest photograph, as I say, but I thought you might enjoy my little brother's forced smile, which is turning into a grimace because of the cold. This picture shows the three of us a year later on Christmas Eve, dressed in bathrobes and holding presents with our usual happy smiles. The actual event that inspired the photograph was not happy at all, but heartbreaking, because this was the Christmas Eve that my father promised after a very long absence to join the family with gifts and never showed up. The bathrobes we're wearing were Christmas gifts my mother gave us early, just for the occasion. And when she saw my father wasn't coming after all, she snapped this photo as if to transform the heartbreak into continuity and contentment. Here we are again on that Christmas Eve, posing for my mother with our very few presents. Family photo albums are common, of course, but my, my mother's three albums have a special meaning, I think, because as she created them in her limited spare time as a single and working mother, she was able to, de to deny the emotional wreckage my father left behind with an alternative story of family togetherness. But as I look closely at this still later photograph taken by a neighbor and lacking my mother's framing mythology, I find clues to the underside of that story. In this snapshot, 
All the neighborhood children wear jackets to protect them from the cold, except for my brother John and me in the back row, who wear only t-shirts, my own t-shirt torn at the collar. In fact, I not only lived in a broken family, but an underclass one, or poverty growing desperate after my father left in the 1940s, and that experience gave me my first awareness as a poet of life outside of the social mainstream. My mother was deeply sympathetic toward blacks, and when I was in second grade or thereabout, she read to me the episodic stories of a black boy named Little Brown Coco. One reason I identified with Coco, no doubt, was that he lived with his mother, who was called Mama, the name I used for my mother, and the father of the family in the stories was absent and never mentioned. But I also liked the Coco stories because of the food. The meals were always sumptuous and fully described, including food we seldom saw in our nearly bare cupboards. I'll read this excerpt for illustration. Then such eating you never saw before in all your born days. The long tables were loaded with more peach cobblers and chocolate pies and angel food cakes and platters of fried chicken and pans of hot rolls and dishes of fresh churned butter and jars of strawberry preserves than you could shake a stick at. <clears throat> Sounds pretty good, doesn't it? Speaking of food, here's Little Brown Coco from another episode, finishing off his mother's batter for pralines. And there's his mother's name, Mama, scattered through the text at the right. Of course, African Americans were stereotyped in the Little Brown Coco episodes, yet I see looking back that despite the stereotyping, the stories increased my sympathy for people who lived outside of social privilege. Each month as they were published in a magazine my mother bought at the local a and market, I cut them out, and together they became my first book, a special statement about their importance to me. When my family was flush in the days before my father left, my mother even bought black dolls for us, as this photo from my album attests. I'm in the middle again, the kid with a black doll, in my own mind, there's a straight line that leads from the socially rejected New Englanders who sometimes appear in my poems back to early materials like these. My mother not only took photographs of me as I was growing up, she kept in this scrapbook a number of things from my childhood, including report cards. Here's one from first grade. What I remember most from first grade is that I had an old teacher we called Miss Dorcas. As you see from the card, her full name was Dorcas Judkins. Love that name. <coughs> Who, for punishment, once dragged me down the hall by the hair. So imagine my surprise in reviewing these materials to find this description of myself from the final quarter in perfectly controlled and sedate handwriting. No sign of the hair dragger here. <coughs> Wesley completes this year's work with an excellent record, has read 19 books. Here's another report card from fourth grade and another quarterly re report. Wesley daydreams, exclamation point. My grade school teachers were upset with me as a daydreamer and my mother in exasperation often called me stubborn. Yet I want to say in my defense that it's by these very two characteristics that is my daydreaming and my stubbornness, that I became in the end a poet. 